Only in the ancient legends it is stated that one day an undead shall be chosen. Leave the undead asylum in pilgrimage to the land of the ancient lords. Lordran. Hi, I'm Tommy Thompson, and this is Design Die. My game design series is part of AI and Games. To date, this series has looked at the intricacies of the most dominant power fantasy in video games, the first-person shooter, looking at both the successes of games such as Titanfall 2 and Doom, but also the failings of the likes of Aliens Colonial Marines. But in this video, we're going to take a look at a game that is, in many respects, diametrically opposed to the core principles of shooter games. A game that demands your attention from the get-go. A game that demands your respect of its systems and keeps the rewards of your pursuits at arm's length. In this video, we visit the land of Lordran, home of From Software's 2011 release, Dark Souls. It's difficult to approach this game now in 2017, six years after the release of the initial game on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, followed by the Prepare to Die edition on PC, its two sequels, and its sister series, Bloodborne. It's the game that almost every aspiring critic has tackled at some point or another on YouTube. As such, finding fresh soil to find purchase can be challenging and listening to another YouTuber discussing it even more so. But I wish to tackle this game in isolation, and for now, without consideration for its legacy. Too many times people talk about Dark Souls being hard, and attribute its value to its perceived difficulty, to the point that we often attribute Souls-esque games as a genre to be an adoption of specific mechanics combined with a base level of difficulty that's typically higher than other games. The notion of difficulty is a challenging topic that's reared its head in recent video game discourse, from the release of the deceivingly cute Cuphead and Jennifer Shurrell's Twitter thread on Game Design Secrets, a thread that yours truly appeared on discussing many of the games I've explored as part of AI and Games. What has followed is a lengthy debate over the notion of skill-based challenges, the notions of difficulty, and this reminded me of the idea of Get Good a meme often used to berate inexperienced players and has a strong association with Dark Souls in the wider discourse. The concept of how difficulty is modelled and expressed to players has gone through a slow evolution over the past 20 to 30 years, some of it a byproduct of the gradual improvement and understanding of games development as a craft, as players interfacing with specific aspects of mechanics and interactions, but also some of it artificially enforced for the purposes of monetization. What's undeniable is that much of our notions of difficulty in contemporary gameplay, particularly given the subsequent rise of esports, is skill-oriented. This has led to a weird form of elitism emerging over games that have high skill-based difficulty, catering to a world of hardcore, true, bleak, real gamers, whatever you want to call it. What I find equally fascinating, as I do frustrating about all of this, is that Dark Souls, a game often held aloft for the need to get good, and for being the game for gamers' sake, isn't actually an issue of video game difficulty, as we now consider it. It's also a game that is, when assessed more in terms of contemporary difficulty, a lot easier than is often stated. What makes Dark Souls continue to be as fun to play as it is intriguing to explore is in truth our cultural programming to video game design. We expect clear instruction, we expect integration, direction, instant reward, and managed expectation. But it doesn't do that. Dark Souls is counter-programming to those expectations. Dark Souls demands your attention. Dark Souls demands your respect. Dark Souls demands that you die. But perhaps most importantly, and the thing that many people miss, Dark Souls wants you to win. It's a game that wants you to persevere, to push forward, to overcome, and to achieve victory. But always keep that victory at least one step away from you. So in this design dive, let's have a look at notions of difficulty systems. How do we typically consider difficulty? What does Dark Souls do to break from such conventions? And then ironically, how the AI actually becomes more of an ally than an adversary. Difficulty is a highly subjective interpretation of the realisation of a game's core components in context of the expectations of how a player will subsequently interact with them. 
Put in more layman terms, we manipulate aspects of a game's core design and code such that it should prove more challenging for a player. But the idea of challenge within context of games is rather multifaceted, pulling from areas of behavioural psychology, reflexes and hand-eye coordination, to lateral thinking and problem solving. As will be discussed throughout this video, the notion of difficulty ultimately boils down to two distinct areas. Difficulty from mechanics and difficulty from semantics. The former is commonplace, the latter is often abandoned in contemporary video game design. But in order for any difficulty tier or system to work successfully, a game must reward the player in the event they achieve that which the designers intended. As Jennifer Sherl stated in her interview with Rolling Stone, most game designers have at least a basic understanding of behavioural psychology and neuroscience. Many of the details of neurotransmitters are still unclear, but we have a general idea of what the orchestra of human perception is made of, and it is essential to gain an understanding of them to know why game designers work the way they do. The reward structure of games typically ties into a principle of behavioural psychology known as positive reinforcement, whereby desirable events or a stimulus of some sort is presented as a result of executing a behaviour as intended. This result is designed to trigger the dopamine pathways in the brain and ultimately give you a bit of a feel-good vibe. You do something right in a game, the game will make you feel good about it, and in turn teaches you that doing that repeatedly is a good thing. The rate at which this reward is delivered in contrast to the actions executed and the level of abstraction involved can vary significantly. It's actually what makes video games a really good testbed for artificially intelligent systems, given that AI is designed to gravitate towards the most rewarding outcomes in a specific problem space, provided we know where they are. The rate of reward distribution, in contrast to the granularity of actions executed, is often referred to as compulsion loop theory, where reward loops are established for specific aspects of play to ensure that players feel rewarded for a given action and do it continually. You can usually break down compulsion loops into three durations, short, medium and long, with short often giving brief bouts of reward repeatedly that are seldom acknowledged consciously, to long-term rewards that give meaning and context to everything done to date to a point that the player feels like they've actually achieved something. So let's start digging into how these reward systems are built into aspects of difficulty and what any of this means in the context of Dark Souls. When we talk about difficulty in contemporary gaming, we're often focused on mechanics and skill-based challenge. We're testing the reaction times and coordination of the player in stressful situations to force the user to absorb a large amount of sensory data, process that within the bounds of their existing knowledge, and make an informed judgement within a very short period of time. The compulsion loop system is often tied strongly to the notion of mechanic-driven difficulty, in an effort to teach players how to utilise a mechanic, and then master it to full effect. This is often quite tightly balanced with more subtle aspects of the game's design, in context with the form and function of the system it's executed upon. Hence the notion of mechanic-oriented difficulty and its reward systems can shift. So while a first-person shooter will typically have the same scoring mechanisms, more subtle aspects of difficulty may be tied to control interfaces. Hence, old-school console FPSs such as Turok Dinosaur Hunter had a different difficulty curve in comparison to a more contemporary example such as Titanfall 2, given the control schemes of their respective eras have changed quite dramatically. Arguably one of the best examples of how player mastery of mechanics can be tied to reward propagation can be found in Nintendo's Super Mario Bros, with coin collection and brick smashing being short term loops that are appealing to the user, medium term where we complete entire levels, forcing the player to keep moving right, earning extra lives by encouraging the repetition of the coin collection short term loop, all the way to long term where Bowser is defeated and the game is won. But Mario isn't a great example in the context of modern difficulty systems, given we typically push players towards achieving games on even harder difficulties. But this seldom is integrated into the core of the game itself. As Simon Parkin discusses in his article on the history of game difficulty in Eurogamer, video game difficulty was then a commercial elaboration, not an artistic one. For many developers, it was a requirement that distracted from their ideal vision for their game. After all, it's not difficult to make a difficult game. You simply weigh the numbers and stack the odds against the player. The much harder task is to create a perfectly calibrated piece of work, one that is, to lean on this medium's pet cliché, easy to learn, but hard to master. We've seen this typically in combat-driven games and quite prevalently in fighting games, where the accuracy of attacks, counter-attacks and more become more precise as the difficulty increases. But it doesn't really yield any stronger a reward in the context of the original design. It arguably makes the long-term reward feel more valuable, 
but naturally that differs from person to person, given, as I said, difficulty is often a very subjective interpretation. These notions of accuracy and reward tied to mechanic execution are tied heavily into the core components of what makes Dark Souls tick on a surface level, and one of the two critical aspects in which we typically perceive this game as difficult is driven by a high level of skill required to interact with it. This alongside a distinctly small amount of reward that is associated with an action being achieved successfully. Returning to my previous example of Mario, coins, bricks and enemies are typically short term, levels and lives are medium, and completion of the game itself is long term. It doesn't have a one to one mapping with Dark Souls, if anything the distance between short to medium to long is wider than ever before, but also that many of the short term rewards are either less potent or are diminished by other patterns exhibited within the game. Firstly, yes, killing a standard enemy does have some small reward to it. The souls accrued make this abundantly clear, but the level of skill required to do so successfully diminishes the value derived from it. Attacking without penalty is tough, managing your blocks requires practice, getting these parries just right even more so. Combat requires precision timing and patience and thus it immediately strips it of the same short term loop time frame as the likes of Mario. In addition, the risk is much higher given actions intended to complete the short term loop always have a significant chance of destroying any progress towards completion of the critical medium term loop, levelling your character at a bonfire. The medium rewards are essentially moving from bonfire to bonfire, with the killing of bosses along the way another more long term medium reward loop, but failure in each instance is pretty jarring. All rewards from the short term loops are dropped on the ground where you died, we're reset back to the last bonfire we visited, but all the world is reset and we're forced to do it again. This is easily where for many the negative reinforcement appears to outweigh the positives. I've got to do it all over again, but with the added pressure that if I fail again I will lose all the previously accumulated resource forever, as it lies there tantalisingly waiting for you to pick it up. But of course, all this mechanic driven difficulty is compounded by the much bigger problems presented by the monsters and Hallowed that haunt the lands of Lordran but there's something really interesting happening right here that's often rather unexpected. To this day I've never found anything 100% concrete on the AI implementation behind Dark Souls, but sources have suggested that it utilises hierarchical task network planning, a method popularised by games such as Killzone 2 and Transformers Fall of Cybertron, and is still used today in the likes of Dying Light and Horizon Zero Dawn. HDN planning is a means by which to construct macro action sequences, where you'll have characters do several things in sequence as part of a core behaviour. Should the number of task networks be large enough, designers can create quite the variety of behaviours, but the thing is, Dark Souls often doesn't really show any evidence of that, or at least fails to show a large variety in behaviour. NPCs will stand idle until the player intersects with range of their sensors, such as being able to see you but also being able to hear you at which point they'll either attack at range or rush towards you to attack up close. They'll defend if they can, evade and even possibly heal, if not they'll simply absorb damage. Evasion and healing typically only occurs once the enemy has less than a third of health and defence largely works ok, but it leaves them open to counter attack either by knocking their shields out of the way or by moving around to attack from behind. Most attack strategies are quite predictable too, even if there is some variability in which particular strategy will be picked. Ultimately, the non-player character AI of this game is, on the whole, rather dumb, but that works in the context of what Dark Souls seeks to achieve. Their stupidity, if you will, is in many cases a requirement, given they need to be simple enough in order to learn how to overcome them. The trick here is that most players don't consider the NPCs in such a fashion, given we largely struggle with three related components of the game's design. The seemingly unwieldy mechanics, the lack of hints and instruction, which I'll come back to later, but also their overt strength in contrast to your own. These three elements effectively mask what are fundamentally simple and not that intelligent opponents from the player. It takes time exploring the world, learning from the environment as is expected and fighting these enemies repeatedly in order to ascertain how best to defeat them. Their strength, which can often result in player death, is aimed at constructing an illusion of intelligence given it makes even the smallest of enemies fraught with peril if we slip up. This actually carries many similarities with playtesting by Bungie when developing the original Halo. As mentioned in Chris Butcher and James Grazimer's 2002 GDC talk, they found an interesting correlation in playtesting between players and the perceived intelligence of AI opponents, that while a smart enemy may appear tough, a tougher enemy will appear smarter. By simply increasing the hit points of the enemies and the damage they dealt, playtesters found them to be more intelligent. 
This perceived toughness helps shroud the lack of intelligence of these characters at first, but in time this is gradually removed as we often die and respawn at bonfires. As mentioned before, while bonfires largely exist as our medium-term loop and reward survival, they also give us more information on the structure of the deterministic nature of the game. The world resets itself after we visit a bonfire, with most, though not all, defeated enemies respawning. They respawn in the exact same place, they behave in almost the exact same way every time. This helps build patterns, this helps build familiarity and confidence. We know where the monsters are, we learn how to predict their attack patterns, and in time can exploit that to full effect. This is how Dark Souls wants you to win, allowing you to build grind spots to help scoop up extra souls for a weapon upgrade or level up. The illusion of intelligence is highly relevant for each of the bosses, given you only ever fight them successfully once per playthrough, and as such it takes several playthroughs of the game, and maybe a good rummage through the community wikis, to get an understanding of their fight patterns and limitations. Once you've figured it out, the issue stems in whether you as a player can actually execute that as expected, which is more critical in the context of, say, Ornstein and Smaug, The Four Kings, or Gravelord Nito, where it's no longer a one-on-one -on -one fight. But the emphasis throughout this video on the mechanics and the NPC AI completely ignores the second aspect of Dark Souls difficulty. We need to also discuss the semantics of Dark Souls design. Dark Souls is undeniably retro in its semantic design, a game that actually rewards the more intelligent exploration of its world by its players. Much of the instruction on how to proceed within the game, as well as the actual lore itself, is hidden away behind item descriptions and environmental storytelling in a way that only video games can cater for. I say retro, given it's rare for modern games to not overtly explain many of its design mechanics and give absolute direction to the player. Dark Souls carries more in similarity with classic adventure games such as the Dizzy series, the original Legend of Zelda, and The Secret of Monkey Island. In each instance, the game only gives a handful, if any, directions on how to complete it, and expects players to explore the world in order to find the best actions to take, with many of these games carrying linear and branching paths in an open world that encourages forward progression, but also exploration. But even in some instances, players can only really learn more about effective strategies after exhaustive experimentation, a trick seldom seen in action games these days, with arguably the raids in Destiny being a rare exception. There are even environmental tutorials in many parts of the game, but it's really easy to miss them. The one time the game overtly communicates its mechanics and gives direction is in the opening minutes of the Undead Asylum. We are told how to complete the basic actions, but secretly also encouraged to start reading orange signs left in the world, which, after the Asylum, typically only come from other Dark Souls players. But then, the world provides other very quick introductions to core mechanics in a way that players seldom realise. Death and Rebirth by Bonfire is deliberately structured for that first Asylum demon battle, but also that attacking from above is explained to you here such that you can repeat it against the Taurus demon in the Undead Burg. So many of the core systems are expressly communicated in the opening minutes of the game, but the mechanic difficulty of the task at hand often makes players lose sight of that. Many core mechanics are reinforced also through the NPC design, with a healthy number of humanoid combatants to encourage blocking, rolling and parrying. The nasty part is that the bosses never actively encourage the need to learn to parry, only to block and roll. As such, the final boss, Gwyn the Lord of Cinder, can prove immensely difficult for players if they haven't continued to practice their block and parry mastery. It's no coincidence that the likes of Anor Londo is filmed to the brim with knights for parrying at the midpoint of the game, a sort of reminder to you that maybe you should start thinking about building up that particular skill. Even figuring out where to go upon reaching the Firelink Shrine takes patience and exploration, but it also rewards you for repeatedly returning to the area for further direction. The crestfallen warrior at Firelink Shrine actually tells you where to go in the beginning if you actually talk to him. Kingseeker Frampt appears after the second bell of awakening has been rung, but we're too busy focusing on the cutscene that shows the opening of the gate at Sen's fortress. Frampt not only tells you of the need to go to Anor Londo, but of acquiring the Lord Vessel if you speak with him. I'll concede that even on my first playthrough, I didn't talk to him until after I had acquired it. Dark Souls rewards your exploration and intellect. By leaving breadcrumbs for you periodically, it makes the sense of discovery its own unique reward system. To find out your hunch was right, to find a path you're supposed to be on, to find out you're actually going the right way. Ultimately, when you peel it apart, Dark Souls is a fascinating exercise in testing a player's intelligence by mystifying the inner workings of a game in a number of simple, albeit effective ways. 
Looking back on it now, I can't help but wonder whether the aggressive stance taken in the advertising was detrimental in our collective understanding of what this game is, and how we should be exploring it. Too quickly did a consensus form within the wider gaming community that Dark Souls is aggressive, unrelenting, toxic even. Which seems largely at odds not only with how it's designed, but with the largely supportive and vocal fanbase who frequently share their insights, discuss their approaches and crowdsource good practice to help new arrivals to the world of Lordran, even to this day. I recorded part of this video during the annual Return to Lordran event, in which the server see a spike of activity as many players return with a new character to Dark Souls once more, thus keeping its community alive, either to help or hinder itself. As I conclude this topic, I confess that my understanding and appreciation of Dark Souls has changed significantly throughout the creation of this video. My newfound perspective comes from what is now my second full playthrough of Dark Souls, and only now realising just how wrong I was. My first successful completion of Dark Souls was in January of 2013. It took me three months and over 70 hours to complete that first playthrough, after two attempts. The first abandoned after making sloppy mistakes with my starting loadout after 8 hours, I boosted my strength, wielding ridiculous weapons, I even killed Soler of Astora because I wanted to see what he was carrying, only to then be unable to use it. Even in my completed playthrough, I'd failed to learn that which Dark Souls sought to teach. My character development was unfocused, I kept using heavy armour, I was cumbersome, only then learning the value of parrying in combat as I fought Gwyn at the end. I finally brought him down after numerous attempts, only to walk away and not touch it again until now. What this game means to me has changed quite drastically over the years, as I've come to learn more about Dark Souls, more about game design as a whole, but also a little bit more about myself as a person. The second, and now third, playthrough has proven invaluable, to teach me the importance of embracing the secrets of Dark Souls lore, or if anything, to ease my frustrations with the game world and pay attention to many aspects of its design that are, frankly, right in your face and you seldom notice. On a more personal level, it's also helped me understand the psychological problems I had while playing this game and make peace with the weird relationship that I have with it. While it's useful, skill is not what makes Dark Souls tick. It's patience and understanding. It's observing the world around you and making concessions, even completely changing the way you play, removing that which is of value or meaning to you and realising you're better off for it. It's about learning not just from your experience, but also from that of others, be in the game or in the wider world. In an era of increasing accessibility of games, from the platforms they're distributed on to the manner in which people can interface with them, we sometimes forget this need not be applied so heavy-handedly to the literacy of the game itself. If anything, Dark Souls draws greater parallels with real life than many other games out there. It rewards patience, study, exploration, lateral thinking and perhaps most importantly, your time. As a piece of entertainment, it legitimately rewards you the longer you spend with it, a real challenge faced by many games in this age, to gain a sense of satisfaction and achievement from your time. Sure, the ending itself is pretty short and simple, but it's that dopamine release, followed by the ability to go again, and maybe not do it better, but to do it differently. That is what Dark Souls rewards players with, a game that is largely static in its construction, including some painfully wooden AI, but deep in both its mythology and mechanical design. The more you experiment, the more you learn both of yourself and the tragedy that has befallen Lordran. But it takes time to learn these values. What is bravery, after all, without a dash of recklessness? For you to truly embrace what kindles the flames of Dark Souls, you must prepare to die. Let the true dark be cast upon the world. Our Lord hath returned. Alrighty, a short wrap up to thank you for watching this design dive on Dark Souls. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do me a favour and give it a like and maybe even a cheeky subscription to AI and Games. It really helps in giving the channel some exposure out there. As always, a thank you to my sponsors via the crowdfunding platform Patreon who are on screen now. For anyone interested in learning more about the phenomena of Dark Souls and its impact upon players and its community, I would strongly recommend reading You Died. The Dark Souls Companion by Keza MacDonald and Jason Killingsworth. It recounts a number of interesting tales about the cultural impact of the original Dark Souls on the gaming world. Also a quick shout out for patrons about the Design Dive vote. We've got a choice of Borderlands 2, Fear or Call of Duty World War 2, with more details on what these will be about over on the Patreon link. Now I've rushed my usual ending here because I want to take a moment to discuss two really important personal things in the context of the making of this video. You can jump to the next video if you want, I'm kind of done saying what I needed to say as part of the main discussion, but I need to get this off my chest. The first thing relates back to my story at the end of the video about how I completed Dark Souls for the first time I made a mess of it. There are two important caveats. Firstly, 
I've never touched this game since, largely because of the negative effect it had on my personality and behaviour, to a point that it had a significant impact on my personal relationships, especially with my partner. When I defeated Lord Gwyn, I yelled at my television, finally letting go of a pent-up rage and aggression that had held over me in the weeks prior. I was summarily told off, and quite rightly so for my behaviour. I was told to stop playing Dark Souls or it would have an impact on the future of our relationship, that it had brought out a really ugly side of my personality, and at that point I did the right thing. I turned off the console and I walked away. I never played Dark Souls again until I made this video, over four and a half years later. In this lies something of a cautionary tale, given that many of the topics of this video, the psychological effects of the game design, the difficulty structure, the reward propagation and delay, the value of information gathered can have a real influence on our mood and general behaviour. I had become the very thing that Keza MacDonald had warned of in her book You Died, the foolish, super hardcore, macho gamer looking to prove my mettle. Thinking that in my own arrogance that my ability, that by sheer force of will I could overcome it, I could defeat it. I could, but by god did I fail to grasp so much of what the game told me. I saw it as a challenge to my supposed ability, my ego and in many ways manifested my own arrogance in a form of anger that I'm kind of embarrassed about now. The second thing is that, well, hang on, I need to break protocol for a minute here. So yeah, I finished Dark Souls on January the 19th 2013, but I'd started that playthrough three months prior on 14th of October 2012. During that time, I lost my dad, and my father died, specifically on the 4th of November of that year, which makes it just over five years ago this month. And that was tough. It's a very difficult time for my family and I, and we lost him at a fairly young age, he was 51, and we were very close. I had a really good relationship with my old man, and anyone who's suffered loss like that will know how difficult it is for everyone touched by it, to try and make sense of the world in each passing day and, you know, to try and keep moving in the aftermath, to try and take stock of your own life as you're passing, uh, you know, as you're mourning the passing of someone else's. But also how to focus your mind and keep yourself moving forward. Because the world just keeps on spinning and at the end of the day it doesn't really feel like anybody actually gives a f I spent my personal time during that period playing Dark Souls, which is and ironic, given it's a game about repetitive death and rebirth, as I'm trying to deal with the really real world, real life equivalent. And I've, and in some respects, my failure to play that game properly, as I discussed at the end of this video, was because I needed to aim myself at something, to focus all my attention and determination on a single point in my life, and I could just smash the shit out of it. Quilag, Ornstein and Smau, the Four Kings, Gravelord Nito, all these people, Gwyn himself, all had became a punching bag for my frustrations. I put it all in that game, because I didn't have anywhere else to put it. And it's taken me until now to realise that that really visceral emotional reaction I had killing Gwyn that first time, what that actually meant for me, um, it was the first real victory in some respects I think I'd had in my life during that time. And that anger and frustration suddenly makes a lot of sense and also subsequently my partner's interpretation of my behaviour at that point in time. Suddenly this all clicks now. Because Dark Souls was in a really strange way my method of grieving. And I've only now come to this revelation about myself and about this game and it's made this particular design dive a, a very personal one. One that's actually brought me some closure. So I wanted to take a moment to thank all my patrons for voting on the video and to my wider audience for continuing to watch these videos because it's been a real boost to me. So thank you. Um, I wouldn't have been here doing this um, and talking about this now if it weren't for you. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's about it. Cool, we'll wrap it up. Be safe, my friends. Don't you dare go hollow.